sorry. Okay. Um, th thank you very much. Um, I, I wanted to start by thanking the, uh, the organizers for the uh, kind opportunity to speak here today. Um, and um, I'll still be looking at uh, optoelectronic properties of materials like the previous few talks in this session, but um, the, the angle I'll take is looking at the effects of the lattice on, on the optical properties. Um, and hopefully the examples I'll give you will convince you that this is sometimes uh, important to take into account. Um, so we can, um, we can use a very simple toy model, such as a di diatomic molecule, to understand why uh, including the effects of the lattice is uh, technically more challenging than not including them. Um, and in order to understand that, we, we just look at a diatomic molecule which has some equilibrium bond length L0. Um, and what we usually do is we fix the ions at that equilibrium bond length, and then we solve for the electrons with whichever uh, method we want. Um, and that electron solution is represented by the cloud here, and then we calculate the properties we're interested in, and a relevant property in this context might be the dipole matrix elements. Um, now, when we want to include the effects of ionic motion or temperature, then we need to take into account the fact that the ions are no longer stationary at their equilibrium positions, but they move about. So uh, for most of the talk, I will assume the adiabatic principle, uh, which means that when we look at different configurations that the atoms also explore, such as shorter bond lengths or longer bond lengths for the, for the molecule, then the electrons instantaneously relax to this new, uh, to, to the new configuration in which, um, in which they sit. And if we now fix the, the ions in this new configuration, we solve for the electrons, we calculate the property of interest again. In general, we'll find a different value for that property. So, um, the question is, what is the actual value of the property when you take into account this, this lattice dynamics? And the adiabatic answer is very simple. It's just the average over all configurations of the system. And this average needs to be weighted by the appropriate probability of finding any given configuration in the system. So this very simple model immediately tells us why it is more challenging to include the effects of lattice dynamics or, or dynamics in general. And that's because rather than having to do a single calculation at the equilibrium bond length, we have to do multiple calculations to understand how the property of interest varies um, uh, as the atoms move around. So if we write this in a somewhat more formal manner, uh, I, I consider some general electronic observable O, and I'm interested in calculating that some finite temperature T. And what we're doing then in the adiabatic uh, picture is to calculate the expectation value of that observable with respect to a, a vibrational wave function, which I represent by this chi here. And this could be something like a, a, set, a, a product of a Gaussian function if we assume the harmonic approximation um, in, in our system. Um, and, and then we have the standard Boltzmann factor, the partition uh, function. And, and I explicitly write the, the use here. The use are the configurations of the atoms, um, which usually we'll describe, say, in a, in a phonon basis if we, if we assume the, the harmonic approximation. So, so the challenge is how do we evaluate this, this type of quantity? And, and there are various ways. Um, the, the, perhaps the, the ideal way would be using something like molecular dynamics or path integral molecular dynamics to generate the configurations which the system explores uh, and then average the, the quantity of interest over, over such a path. And we heard this morning how uh, machine learning techniques can help accelerate this type of, of calculations. Um, but if we're really only interested in equilibrium properties of systems rather than maybe uh, uh, dynamical properties, then one could just use other methods which are somewhat computationally simpler. And one of them is just realizing that this is, after all, a high dimensional uh, integral. And the best way to evaluate high dimensional integrals is using stochastic methods. Uh, so what one could do is one could um, use Monte Carlo integration, for example. And in the particular case where we assume the harmonic approximation for the lattice dynamics, then uh, it's actually very simple because this, these objects are just uh, uh, Gaussian functions. And you can directly sample stochastically Gaussian functions. And then you just uh, average over all configurations um, uh, that you generate in that way. Um, now, an even simpler method uh, or family of methods, which I label here as quadratic methods, is one in which you expand uh, to some low order uh, the property of interest. So if we look at this uh, electronic observable at some general configuration of your system U, uh, where U equals zero is the equilibrium configuration, then I can write down an expansion uh, in terms of, say, phonon modes if I have a harmonic picture. Um, and this expansion, in principle, has uh, 
uh, terms at all orders, but then I decide to truncate this expansion at some order, say second order. Um, and, and the expression that result from this are relatively simple. For example, if again I work within the harmonic approximation, then this uh, nuclear density is actually an even function. So when I overlap that even function with this expansion, all the odd terms in the expansion will integrate to zero. Uh, and that means that to, to, to third order, the, the expression uh, is relatively simple. You just get that the value of your observable of interest at some finite temperature is equal to the static lattice value, and then um, it has a quantum zero point contribution, a thermal contribution, which is essentially a Bose-Einstein occupation factor, and then this is the phonon frequency, and this is the, the coupling constant, essentially, which is the curvature of the property with respect to a displacement of the atoms. Um, so so uh, the, the, the the argument I made at the beginning about the computational expense of, of, of including uh, lattice dynamics is here exemplified by this sum here, where you need to add all this, you need to sum over all the degrees of freedom in your system. In molecular systems, you just have the, the, the different phonon modes. In solids, you also have the Q vector, which is the, um, the momentum of the phonons that you need to sum over. So, um, so these are the type of expressions that we want to use when we want to incorporate uh, lattice dynamics into our calculations. Um, and um, the, the approach I want to describe, or we want to use actually, is based on finite differences. So there, uh, expressions like these are also amenable to linear response methods, um, which have many advantages, such as the, the ability to use a single primitive cell to do the calculations. Uh, but finite difference methods also have some advantages, and these will prove uh, essential for some of the applications I'll show. And in particular, the advantages are that you can use them very easily with any sort of uh, electronic structure method that you want to use, because you calculate the coupling by explicitly distorting the atoms in your system, um, and then you can use GW, bit salpit, whatever you want uh, in that context. Um, but finite displacement methods are, are computationally expensive, so we've been, we've been working a little bit on trying to, to make them somewhat cheaper, uh, and I just want to give you a, an example of one, some of the ideas that we have. Um, and this particular one is, is relatively simple. Um, so, and that concerns this problem of having to sample many points uh, in, in configuration space. Um, so, so the idea comes from, uh, from very basic mathematics, the so-called mean value theorem for integrals. So, and, and you have to imagine the following. So you have a function f of x in red that we're trying to integrate from a to b. Um, and if we want to evaluate that integral numerically, what we would usually do is we would evaluate the function at many points between a and b and then take some sort of average over those points. And that's exactly equivalent to sampling the configurations in your system and calculating the property of interest and averaging over that. Now there's something called uh, the mean value theorem for integrals, uh, which tells you that um, for any such function, uh, there's always at least one point C somewhere in the integration interval for which the value of the function at that point is actually equal to the value of the integral you're trying to calculate. So another way of putting that is that the area under the red curve here is equal to the area under the flat uh, blue line there. Um, now, this sounds very, very nice because if we knew what that point C is, then all we have to do is we have to calculate the function at that point, and then we've solved the integral. Now, of course, the challenge is that in general we don't know what that point C is before we do the integral. Um, but, but nonetheless, this actually motivated us to, to try and find very good approximations to, to such a point, point. Um, and this actually turns out to be relatively uh, quite possible in the electron phonon uh, problem. And uh, here I'm writing one, one such approximation, which is um, the approximation when you make the assumptions that your system is harmonic and that the electron phonon interaction is to lowest order. When you make these two assumptions, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, what this solution tells you is that if for each phonon mode of, of the system you give an amplitude equal to the uh, square root of the uh, mean displacement, then uh, the value of the property at that particular configuration will be equal to the thermal average over all configurations. And in this way, you replace potentially thousands of calculations over different configurations with a single calculation uh, on, this, on this particular configuration. Um, so, so this is the solution for, for the harmonic uh, low order uh, uh, case. Uh, we actually now have uh, extensions to this to both relax the, the harmonic condition on the lattice dynamics and the low order in the electron phonon interaction. And in those cases, we cannot actually find solutions uh, with a single point, but we can find solutions with just a very few points of the order of 10, say. Um, so, so this is an example of the sort of trick that we use to, to reduce the computational cost to do these calculations. Uh, we, we, also, we also very carefully choose uh, uh, which sort of supercells we use in order to capture the relevant uh, vibrations of the, of the lattice, but I won't go into, into more detail about this. Uh, today, what I want to do for the rest of the, of the talk is to just give you a few examples of how we can use this to, to do some, some physics. 
Um, so, so the first example is perhaps uh, very simple. So the quantity we're interested in here is just the, the, the pure single particle uh, electronic energy in, in our system. Um, and, and the example is actually uh, from a collaboration that, that we did with a group of uh, Aaron Walsh. Um, and we were looking at, uh, this comes from the photovoltaics context, um, a class of materials called uh, kesterite. So these are quaternary materials um, which um, are essentially uh, the, the next layer evolution from the, the so-called uh, six, um, with, with the uh, representative example being copper, zinc, uh, tin, uh, sulfur. Uh, and the advantage of these materials for solar cell applications is that uh, both these, uh, all these elements are uh, earth abundant and uh, non-toxic. So, so it would be very nice to be able to make uh, solar cells out of these uh, readily available materials. Um, and the, the idea behind it, this sort of family of solar cells is that uh, they're just uh, a derivation from six, which are about 20% efficient. So this type of material looks prom look promising. Um, however, their efficiencies are not, are not as, uh, as good as uh, other materials. And there, there are quite a few uh, competing theories as to why that might be the case. Uh, and, and one possible explanation is the, is the band alignment between the absorbing layer and the transport layer. And this is the, the sort of thing we wanted to look at here. Um, and what we, what we looked at it specifically was the, the temperature dependence of, of the band alignment be, between, between uh, this type of material. So here the example is uh, cesium, uh, CZTS and cadmium sulfide. So what we do is we, we just calculate the temperature dependence of, of the, essentially the, 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 the energy levels of this material. Uh, and here I just dissect uh, what it looks like for, for CZTS. Um, so, so, so this is the, the, the correction to the band gap uh, of the material um, uh, at any given temperature. So we have a correction even at zero temperature arising from quantum zero point motion. And then we have a further thermal correction. Um, and, and the red line corresponds to the correction arising from uh, electron phonon coupling, which we calculate using the methods I've just been, I've just been describing. Uh, we, of course, also have a contribution from thermal expansion, and that we simply calculated with uh, the standard quasi-harmonic approximation. Um, and then the overall correction is a, is a combination of both. Uh, but the interesting thing is that this actually does make a big difference in, in, in band alignment. So in this particular case, if we, if we ignore temperature altogether, we get a, a band difference of about 0.10 EV for the conduction uh, band minimum. Um, and, um, and at room temperature, which is perhaps more relevant for solar cell applications, we get about a 70% uh, uh, change in the, in the band alignment. So, so these are effects that, that could be important in, in this type of materials. Uh, the, the second example is moving away from uh, uh, individual electronic energy levels and looking at uh, uh, dipole matrix elements, so, so the, the connection between them. And the first example is single particle uh, optical absorption. Um, and, and the example... Um, that I want to look at is uh, indium oxide. Uh, so indium oxide um, is a material that's being uh, used for uh, transparent conducting applications. Uh, so this is the, the primitive cell, the cubic primitive cell with about 40 atoms in it. So it looks rather complex. Uh, and this is the band structure. And it's very, very easy to see why it's very useful for transparent conducting applications. So this is the, the valence band. Uh, there is a, a big band gap here. Um, and then it turns out that it's very easy to, to dope this material to move the Fermi level here. Um, and then these electrons here can, can provide the conduction, but also there is also then a big band gap between here and here, and therefore while they conduct, they also retain some transparency, which makes it uh, a good material for transparent conducting applications. So this, ha this material has been well known for, has been used for, for, for a very long time in this context. Uh, but the reason why we're interested in this, and this is work that we did uh, with um, uh, Andrew Morris, um, so if you look uh, a bit more closely uh, uh, at, at, at the band gap, which is uh, around the gamma point, uh, you, you realize the following. So uh, indium oxide uh, has uh, inversion symmetry is one of the symmetry operations of the material. Uh, and that means that uh, you can classify the states at the gamma point according to their parity. Now, it turns out that the parity uh, of the conduction band minimum and the valence band maximum is the same in this material. Uh, and if we look at the dipole matrix element, um, if uh, the dipole operator is an odd operator, and therefore if it connects two states of the same parity, then this matrix element vanishes. That means that in reality, um, absorption should only start from, from lower lying bands that have opposite parity to, um, to, to the conduction band minimum. So, so, so if, we, if we do the calculation of, uh, of the absorption uh, 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 coefficient of, of this material uh, at the static lattice level, we get these uh, dashed black lines, and, and that's the, the experimental result. And um, so, so a few things here. So th this line here 
is the so-called uh, optical gap, and that's, that's the point from which uh, uh, there is a strong absorption observed uh, experimentally um, and also uh, uh, theoretically, uh, and that corresponds to the, to the lower-lying band that has the opposite parity to the conduction band uh, uh, minimum. But then, uh, theoretically, we, we do actually get some absorption uh, all the way to the, to the, to the valence band, uh, to, to the actual valence band maximum, and that's because uh, although the, the stage at the gamma point uh, can be definitely classified according to that parity. As soon as you move a little bit away from the gamma point, then parity is no longer a good quantum number, and therefore you get some contribution from, from, the other, uh, from the other parity. And although the states are still largely aligned to the parity of the gamma point, you, you still have some transitions, and that's what, what this represents. But then the, 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 the conundrum here really is that although we do get some absorption there, it's actually multiple orders of magnitude weaker than what's observed experimentally. So this is again where where phonons come in, and, and phonons can mediate this transition. Uh, and, and if we include uh, phonons at, at various temperatures, then th this is the absorption spectrum that we get. Um, and it does uh, increase the, the absorption compared to the static lattice result by multiple orders of magnitude, and also it moves um, closer to, to, the experimental, uh, to the experimental results. Um, the, the other important thing to note is that we also capture uh, a, a redshift, essentially, in the, in the absorption onset um, of, uh, of this material uh, that, that, is, that is appearing due to uh, increasing temperature. Um, so let me go to the, to the third example. Um, so the, the third example is really uh, um, to do with uh, phonon-assisted luminescence, uh, and it is more um, uh, uh, an advertisement of, of the work of uh, two other people, really. Um, so, so this is the work uh, of uh, Elena Canuxia and uh, Claudio uh, Takalite. And uh, Elena had actually a poster on this uh, la last night, and she's still around in the conference, so uh, please do speak to her about this. But um, so, so they were interested in looking at uh, hexagonal boron nitrite and the luminescence in this material. Um, and um, this is what the band structure of, uh, so this is bulk hexagonal boron nitrite, and that's what the band structure looks like. You have a uh, the, the top of the conduction band, uh, the, the top of the valence band near the K point, and the bottom of the uh, conduction band near the M point. So it's an indirect band gap uh, semiconductor. Um, but, um, but but there's actually luminescence uh, across this indirect gap. So, so they were interested in trying to, to capture that theoretically, and and they just wrote to me about uh, about using finite differences in this context, and I, I gave them very little advice, and they very nicely uh, included me in their work. Um, but so, so, what, so what we ended up doing here was, um, um, so, so uh, in order to, to describe uh, luminescence, uh, you, you need to solve the, uh, the out of equilibrium uh, beta cell Peter equation. Uh, and that, that's, that's a rather uh, hefty computational task. Um, so unlike the other examples where we actually included uh, uh, all, the, all the phonon modes in the system, uh, to, to look at the, at the temperature dependence. In this particular case, we actually uh, limited ourselves to, to looking only at the, at the specific phonon mode that has the correct momentum to exactly bridge uh, the, uh, the momentum difference between the conduction band minimum at the end point and the valence band minimum at the K point. And that happens to be uh, th this phonon mode here um, if, if we look at the phonon dispersion of, of this material. Um, so, um, so, so this is actually the, 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 only, the only phonon mode that we include in, in the calculations, well, all, all the phonon modes at, at this wave vector. Um, and, and these are the results. So, so in this particular case, we actually uh, went, went beyond the adiabatic uh, approximation um, and uh, using time dependent perturbation theory, uh, just in the same way as uh, Holberdin and Blatt did in the, in the 1950s to, to describe phonon assisted optical absorption, uh, but in this case, in the excitonic basis, uh, th then you can, you can derive the, 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 the expression for the photoluminescence intensity. Um, and uh, this is the, um, uh, the exciton dipole matrix element, essentially. Um, and what we're doing is we, we're essentially we're displacing uh, the, the relevant phonon in the system and looking at the change in that. Um, and then these are just the occupation factors, uh, energy conservation terms, and crucially, uh, we have the, 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 the phonon contributions in, 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 the, in the energy conserving terms. Uh, and these, again, are the Bose-Einstein factors. Uh, and these are the results. So, so the, the, the orange, um, so, so the material has a, so, so this is the, the exciton is actually uh, to, um, two excitons uh, divided by about 0 0.01, uh, 0 0.01 eV, I think. Um, and and th these are dark in the calculations uh, if you don't include phonons. Uh, experimentally, you do see a little bit of, of signal, which probably comes from some defects in the, in the material. Um, but then if you, uh, if you do uh, calculate the, 
the, the intensity using this equation, then we get the, the blue curve here, uh, which very nicely reproduces the, the experimental curve, and we have all the resonances, each of these corresponding to, to each of the uh, various phonon modes uh, in, uh, at this wave vector. Um, and, and, and we reproduce relatively well both the, the position and the relative intensities uh, of, of, of the spectrum. Um, so so I'm, actually, I'm actually done. So uh, uh, th that's really all I wanted to say. Uh, I hope I've convinced you that uh, uh, it can be important when looking at the optoelectronic properties of materials to include the effects of, of temperature as they can have uh, important consequences uh, in what we observe. Thank you.